everybody for joining us. This is our monthly series for Heart Trending. I'm really privileged today to be with Dr. Jennifer Reimer, who is coming out to us from Duke University. Dr. Reimer is an interventional cardiologist, specialized and passionate for uh, complex coronary intervention, preferred intervention. She is the John Bush Simpson Associate Professor of Medicine. She currently received funding from HLBI, uh, Novo Nordisk, Kaizi, and Abbott Pharmaceutical, and she performed multiple research uh, projects at the Duke Clinical Research Institute, or DCRI. And also, she's a previous recipient of TCT Lemire Award of Early Career Intervention Cardiology. And for the people who don't know this award, this is a very competitive award that, that is hundreds of people apply to it for a certain age group younger than 40. And competition is very high. Dr. Reimer, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you guys today um, and talk about something that I th I'm really passionate about, which is um, instant restenosis, but I'm also going to talk about instant uh, thrombosis and, and really um, sort of a focus on management of stent failure as a whole. Um, so the sort of reasoning for my interest in this, um, uh, both from a research perspective that was on the, the sky consensus um, uh, paper on ISR in um, instant thrombosis recently, um, and then um, also uh, am doing some active research in this area. So going to talk a lot about um, management of stent failure today. So relevant disclosures, I think we've already mentioned these just briefly. Um, so I'm going to start off with, I have a couple of cases that I'd like to go through. I think this really sort of sets the stage. Um, for um, uh, everything that's uh, that I'm going to talk about here, the etiology of stent failure, um, management of both ISR and instant thrombosis, and um, some new treatments for ISR and IST. All right, so um, here is um, a presentation, a patient that I took care of, a 50-some-year-old um, female. Um, she had come to us, had already had multiple scent layers, unfortunately, diabetic, normal EF, um, and this was one of my first casts of her. Um, so, so obviously you can see severe uh, restenosis, um, the distal left main, osteal LAD, and osteal circumflex artery. Um, she's having uh, rest angina, um, was just really miserable with this presentation, actually leaked troponin. Um, uh, of this presentation. And so uh, we, had, we talked a lot about her case. Um, she had been thought not to be a cabbage candidate in outside hospital because she had very distal LED stent in place. And it was thought by um, sort of the outside surgeons that because of that distal LED stent and because of um, the distal calcification, um, that uh, she could it'd be potentially problematic in terms of um, uh, uh, a lima being grafted into um, her distal LAD. Um, she had multiple layers in both the LAD and the circumflex um, and concerns that the stent, uh, like I said, um, uh, it was too distal for cabbage. So you can see here, this was my post uh, restenosis or um, post uh, procedure, as you can see here. Um, unfortunately, we did have to add one more layer um, into both her circumflex and, and LAD. This was her um, second layer um, in her LAD and then third in her circumflex. Um, never like to do that because we'll talk a little bit today about how the restenosis rates are very, very high when that's, when that's the case. And, the, and this is the last angioplasty or stenting for her was months ago or years ago? Um, it was years ago. So she had actually done quite well um, uh, up into the point that that I had seen her and then had had, had really sudden symptoms. But as I further determined, um, uncontrolled diabetic, her LP little a was extremely high. Her LDL was uncontrolled. She had a lot of risk factors that were not being um, totally managed up to that point. Um, and so a lot, lot to sort of um, to deal with there. This was her IVUS here. Um, So as you mentioned, that angiogram uh, showing that it's a very poor distal targets for the lima, mm -hmm. and she has multiple stents before, so it make it unfortunately not a good surgical candidate. Yes, and so we were we were really concerned about that. You can see, um, you know, she has some some components of of I of neoathero, but I think what I was most struck by was 
really, really under expanded since um, particularly um, the distal LAD um, on, on our IBIS. Unfortunately, she kept coming back. Um, she kept representing with chest pain. We would take her to um, the cath lab. We would balloon, um, did a laser a few times um, and would get her to a better place, but it wasn't a durable result. Um, and, and like I said, it was really affecting her lifestyle and, and obviously um, I think her, her long-term outcomes. Um, so ended up sending her to one of our surgeons um, at Duke um, got a, a CT, were able to find a, an area where the, the lima could be tied in. Um, she got, I'm happy to say, a, a cabbage, uh, a two-vessel cabbage, one to her circ and to her LAD, and has done really, really well. And so why do I bring up um, this particular uh, patient at a, a sort of a stent conference or an interventional cardiology forum is that I think in a lot of these patients, once they have come to you and they already have so many layers um, and the initial layers are very underexpanded, no matter what you do, it's often hard to sort of move the nickel with them, right? It's really hard to, to, ex to expand those underexpanded stents. Um, she had some components of stent fracture. Um, and in these young patients, I think it's important to at least consider, could you get them a durable surgical strategy um, if they're in a, in a case like this? And so you know, this was, I think, a great um, scenario where surgery really made a lot of sense, and we were able to to, to get her a, a good cabbage. Um, but management of ISR, so, you know, I, I think we're going to see this more and more frequently as we're uh, taking care of sicker and sicker patients out into older age. We're going to start to see um, drug-eluting stents fail more and more, or um, when there's underutilization of intravascular imaging, which I'll talk a lot about here today, um, we're going to see, I think, more ISR, and, and actually some recent NCDR data that I've been looking at actually shows that the ISR rates in the U.S. are increasing. Uh, right now, the latest publication is around 10%, um, but with, with um, like I said, with, with managing patients older and older these days and offering procedures, we're going to see more layers of scent and more scent failure. Um, so I think important to sort of keep that 10% in mind. And now, what about the presentations of, of ISR? I think a lot of us think, oh, you know, these patients present subtly. Uh, really, that's not the case. Um, so you can see that the rates of um, non-semi, semi-unstable angina, non-ACS presentations about stable over time. This was NCDR data from 2009 to 2017. And you can see um, the different presentations have been about the same in terms of the incidence, but what I wanted to uh, call out here is that for patients presenting with ISR, um, the rates of non-STEMI are about 20%, um, STEMI 8.5%, unstable angina about 50%. So quite a few of your ISR patients, have, in fact, one in four um, with ISR will present with non-STEMI or STEMI, um, another half will present with unstable angina. So ACS is the predominant um, presentation of instant restenosis. And so, you know, modes of failure. So I always, you know, I always tell my fellows, like, you can't know how to get better. You can't know what's exactly going on with the stent in terms of why it failed without imaging. Um, and we know that imaging is, is very um, divergent in how it's used around the country, um, anywhere from 11 to 20 percent um, nationwide. Now, some areas are using the vast uh, majority of, of cases are getting imaging, but I think that that's few and far between still. And so I think in, in our recent SKY document, um, we published a lot of imaging um, in hopes of, of giving people um, sort of graphics on, on what um, stent failure looks like and the various mechanisms in OCT and IVUS, um, whether it be um, whether it be stent, whether it be stent fracture, um, malapposition, neoatherosclerosis, any of those um, sort of understanding what those look like, because if you don't know the mechanism, very, very hard to understand how to actually um, treat. And then you can see here, this is for IVIS too, and I am totally aware that um, many places use, um, uh, you know, um, uh, IVIS more frequently or OCT more frequently, whatever I think people are most comfortable with, important just to understand 
um, what the various um, images are actually showing you. You know, and predictors of ISR. So when I think about when I'm doing a case like the, the example I showed, or when I'm doing, um, you know, a, 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 another case where I'm trying to think about, well, how do I prevent this patient from coming back? Um, you know, I think a lot about some of the, the aspects of, of imaging that I talked about. Um, am I getting adequate apposition? Um, am I understanding, is there edge dissection that I'm not aware of? Um, you know, did, did I accidentally leave a little gap between the two cents and not overlap them? Um, all of those things are important to know and important to understand um, area. And, and when you're doing bifurcations, as I'm um, sort of showing here, really important to understand that the the rates of restenosis are quite high. So this was just one study um, published back in 2011 in CERC interventions, but has been shown time and time again. Um, for those patients that are having left main PCI, this is really the cohort of patients. Out of all of them, you have to use imaging because the risk of restenosis is so high. And, and certainly you're newing, doing a, um, a non-bifurcation left main rates of restenosis about four and a half percent. But if you're doing a bifurcation two cent strategy, the restenosis rates are um, almost 25%. Um, and this really hasn't changed um, in, in more contemporary data. Uh, so 25% is, is quite high, Dr. Reimer. Don't you agree? I mean, especially with the recent uh, thin struts and all the optimization. So uh, we must be doing something technique wise or size wise, not right. No, I, th I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, 25% sounds really high, but when we were, I can tell you, we had an intravascular imaging um, a panel discussion, a think tank at Sky, and the rates of, even in left main PCI, uh, the rates of intravascular imaging in the United States, um, it, it is the really a minority of cases that are still getting um, intravascular imaging. And it's just impossible to uh, to place uh, to to place the correct stent in the correct place without imaging and bifurcation cases, and so I think um, once imaging catches on more, particularly in this cohort, I think that we'll see a, a, a decrease in this. Um, yeah. And then, so how do we pre prevent? So I've talked a little bit th about this already. Um, so this was published just a, about a year and a half ago. This was looking. Um, from some of our national data at what the percent of IVUS um, use is. And so you can see in um, up to 2016, it was about 11% and has grown um, up to 16.5%. More recent data I've seen um, somewhere between 18 to 20%. So certainly increasing. Um, and certainly, um, you know, some centers are again um, using it 100% of the time, some centers are using it rarely. Um, but I think uh, over time, and, and I'll talk about this, we have to focus on certain cohorts where at least we all agree that imaging must be used 100% of the time. And so this came from the same paper, um, looking at um, sort of the, the variations in use around, around the U.S. So IVIS used in greater than 10% of PCIs, about 21 um, of those hospitals. Um, so you can see your total there. Um, that's about a third um, of the hospitals right there. IVIS used in 5 to 10%, 14 of the hospitals. No IVIS used um, or less than 1%, 10 of the hospitals. And um, again, no intravascular imaging or intravascular imaging in the vast minority of the time is problematic because, as you probably know, if you're not using it every single case, you're not not really, I think, learning how to use it appropriately. Um, you've really got to use it, um, even in the, the simplest of cases, to really understand how to use um, imaging right. And, and I, I find this paper fascinating. And, and this was um, uh, this was a matter and colleagues um, in Michigan, uh, published in CERC Interventions in 2022. And, and they asked the question, what predicts whether you're going to use intracoronary imaging? And now most of us would think, well, that has to be patient anatomy, patient comorbidities. Uh, but really, uh, what's fascinating to me is the greatest predictor of whether you use IVI or not is the performing physician in the hospital, which is being performed at. So 
outside of left main PCI, so your co cohort of patients having a, a left main PCI, um, the greatest predictors of whether you got um, intravascular imaging to optimize PCI was the performing physician and the performing hospital. Um, and certainly other ones where if you were looking at um, instant restenosis or LAD PCI, but again, that's, that's telling right there. And I think additionally what's telling 16.6% um, of the patients got um, any sort of intravascular imaging. And I know a lot has been done within um, that group and that consortium um, that has been quite successful in improving their rates of, of intravascular imaging. But I suspect that this is this is pattern that you could see geographically all around the country. And then um, which patient cohorts must have IVI? So when we were at the Sky Think Tank recently, and there will be a paper coming out in JSky about this, um, the, sort of the findings of the Think Tank, uh, we really started to, to focus in on what cohorts um, should always get intravascular imaging. You know, we, we don't think that, um, you know, it, it's really a great goal or really a possible goal, whether I should say, uh, to get 100% intravascular imaging across the country every single time, but what cohorts absolutely must have it. Um, and really, uh, those cohorts, I think that we most highlighted were left main disease, those with instant restenosis, um, and those with a bifurcation, at the least, those are the cohorts that we should, should really be focusing in on to understand either the mechanism of stent failure and to make sure we're appropriately sizing um, stents as in left main disease and bifurcation. But you can see, um, even in those cohorts, 7.7% um, got um, IVUS for ISR, only a third got IVUS for left main. Just wrap your head around that 66%, and you were surprised to see 25% rate of restenosis, but 66% don't use any intravascular imaging for left main PCI. Um, and then 85% don't use it for bifurcation lesions. Um, and so I think to me that it doesn't surprise me that we still have these high rates of restenosis in these, these more complex lesions um, when we're not um, using, it, using it frequently and using it often. And then one of the things uh, I think that's, that's important, um, do train, does training support IVI? And so uh, many of you all are familiar that there was a document um, published in Circuit Interventions back in 2023 um, to really outline um, sort of the basics. So, so how many cases, how many PCIs should you be doing? How many peripherals should, be, should you be doing? Structural interventions, so on and so on. And it also outlined um, how many cases of intravascular intracoronary imaging should you be doing within a fellowship um, training experience. And the published threshold was 25 um, and, and that may seem very low, but that was based on the fact that uh, around the country at that point, about 10% of patients were getting um, uh, intravascular imaging um, during PCI, and you have to perform 250 procedures um, to graduate from a fellowship, so about 10% of your procedures should be done with intravascular imaging. I think the problematic part of that is, A, that's a small number. B, uh, the other issue is if you're getting trained by potentially by operators that are not doing it 80, 90% of the time and not really understanding how to interpret the images, um, those 25 cases um, may not be illustrative of what you'll see out in practice or be enough um, to help you um, get prepared for independent practice. And so why the low utilization for IVI? And I know that this is a talk on ISR and um, uh, stent failure, um, but that talk cannot come without an understanding of, of why it's difficult um, to increase uptake of, of intravascular imaging um, in this country. And a lot of it is um, operator inexperience or operators feeling uncomfortable taking up a new, a new technology um, there's a perceived lack of need uh, for potentially if you've been practicing for a long time, never needed it or never had it rather um, in the past. Maybe you don't perceive the need to have it now. Um, a time requirement, even though it doesn't take very much time once you um, have utilized it a lot. 
Um, I have heard that there are some concerns over reimbursement and potentially in very straightforward type A lesions, um, certain operators at in certain institutions being discouraged from using it, um, institutional culture, and then um, you know some other um, issues with potentially extra contrast and availability um, as in with OCT. And you know I think um, it's really imperative though that we we train uh, the upcoming classes to be able to change this culture because I think that that's actually where the culture will be changed. Um, and but we have to train them adequately to understand what the um, what the images look like. So you know I, I remember um, at the uh, it, there's a the fall CRF um, course where they perform a survey each year to say, well, here's the images, here's a, a, an image illustrating stent fracture and illustrating stent malopposition. And they ask the fellows, how comfortable are you with interpreting intravascular imaging pictures? Um, and about 85% um, indicated very, very comfortable, um, feel ready for independent practice. But when they actually tested them, to understand um, whether they could look at this image and understand what it was, about seven to 10% actually were able to um, answer all the questions correctly. So I think a big um, knowledge gap, confidence to sort of knowledge ratio of, of what you actually know being what's actually correct. Now, what about trials examining treatment strategy? So I've talked a lot about intravascular imaging, but what about how we treat it and what's changing in terms of how we treat um, um, instant restenosis? And there have been many, many trials. I love graphics like this because um, they really show over time, all the way back from the late 90s um, to, to present, um, where the field has moved. You know, in the past we had only balloon angioplasty and, and, and brachytherapy, I think, was um, was used more in the past than now. It is uh, certainly still available at many centers, um, but now um, you know replacement with with cutting and scoring balloons, and, and ex uh, I think a lot of excitement around drug coated balloons and what this could do for um, for ISR and how this could help us potentially avoid more and more um, additional layers of stent. And so I'll just go through some of these. Um, for laser atherectomy, um, you can see here that um, this was a look and published back in 2021 at the use of laser atherectomy in ISR. Um, and certainly um, in the various subsets, um, ISR, um, the most common use for laser um, uh, CTOs, um, other sort of non-specific um, subsets of patients um, commonly used as well, but ISR is still the most predominant reason why laser um, is used to try to help debulk. You can see here 32% um, make up um, uh, the use of laser atherectomy, um, CTOs, thrombosis, SVGs, and other multiple lesions um, come subsequently. Another question that's come up, and so, um, you know, a patient comes in, they have one layer of stent, they have ISR, does it then help to, to use um, a different drug-eluting stent in terms of clinical outcomes? Um, this has been answered a while back, but I think um, worth just briefly mentioning, um, this oftentimes comes up in various questions, does it help to, to alternate or use a different type of, of stent? Uh, it was found not in terms of um, death, MI, or target lesion revascularization, um, or in terms of representation with ISR, really no difference whether you switched um, stent or not um, when the patient presented with, with instant restenosis. Rotational atherectomy certainly can be used, I think is, is less frequently used for um, ISR. There's been some diverging uh, um, clinical evidence in, in, um, uh, in, the, in the literature about uh, rotational atherectomy for ISR in particular, um, some demonstrating that it does improve um, the endpoint of MACE. So you can see um, artists and roster. There's been other evidence, though, um, to suggest that there's really no significant difference um, in terms of sort of shorter term clinical outcomes between balloon angioplasty and rotational atherectomy, but still can be a very, very, I think, useful modality. Um, but the one I think everybody is excited about, as I've mentioned um, previously. Dr. Is, um, uh -huh. Sorry, just want to ask a question on the previous slide about atherectomy. 
Is yeah. there a time or age of the stent where atherectomy is considered safe or a um, certain kind of time period since the implantation of the stent or any stent can be, uh, we can perform atherectomy? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And certainly, um, you know, I think just within, as within lithotripsy, um, you would not want to use um, atherectomy or lithotripsy on really fresh stents. Um, and there's a lot of debate, I, I think, around that particular question, um, particularly with lithotripsy, when it's safe to, to use it. Um, some people have said, you know, it's not safe before six months. Other people say it really depends on the clinical scenario. Um, so if the clinical scenario is um, you can't achieve um, uh, improvement in your, your lumen gain with any other modality, you sort of have to do what you can do. I think most people would say at least six months um, for lithotripsy or um, other atherectomy uh, modalities is probably a safe time period to wait um, before um, really attempting um, to use this. But I have been in situations where, again, if you, you don't have a lot of options, um, you sort of have to do what you have to do. Good, good question. So, so DCBs, um, this was published earlier this year in JAMA. Um, a lot of excitement around the, the Boston Scientific um, DCB, um, 600 patients in total, uh, 40 US sites. As you can see um, the key inclusion criteria there, they had to have a, um, a lesion that previously was treated with a bare metal or drug eluding stent. Um, they had to have a re reasonable size vessel, somewhere between two to um, four millimeters. They were asymptomatic. Um, their stenosis had to be greater than 70, less than 100. Symptomatic, greater than 50, less than 100. And then they didn't include those patients coming back with semi, with bifurcations, left main, vein graft, or who had thrombus um, in the target vessel. And it was a two to one randomization. Um, they had to have successful pre-dilatation um, with a semi-compliant balloon, um, and then they would be randomized to either agent um, drug-coated balloon or just a regular old POBA. Um, the primary endpoint was target lesion failure at one year, and this was um, comprised of target lesion revascularization, um, target vessel myocardial infarction or cardiac death, and then they also had the following um, clinical follow-up. So we're going to continue to see the follow-up on um, DCB um, as more of the late um, follow-up is gathered. But I think everyone very excited, uh, target lesion failure reduced from about 28.7% all the way down to 17.9% in those patients that got drug-coated balloons um, compared to uncoated balloons and p-value of 0 0.003 also saw a significant reduction in target lesion revascularization. Um, and I think a lot of excitement here because I think it holds the hope that maybe this is a treatment that, um, you know, we can prevent having to use the second and third layer of stent or at least try to avoid those for a period of time um, down the road. I think many of us that have used DCB in peripherals know that it's, um, it's really key and oftentimes helps us, even in those patients who haven't had previous stents, it really helps us avoid stents. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm excited to, to see this come in, in routine practice in the U.S., but I think for ISR, this is, is probably the most um, significant and exciting um, data that we have thus far. Absolutely. That's what open options. Now it's everybody excited, and you can see it on social media. Everybody's kind of getting the lab slowly, one by one. But uh, that's a great option for patients who are, like similar to the case you presented the first, uh, first or second slide, it's a, a very um, good option for them. Yeah, no, I think so. And, and you know, I think there was a, um, I think uh, the, the nice thing now is there was the whole paclitaxel controversy around paclitaxel um, and increased mortality with um, peripheral vascular interventions. It was actually pulled off the shelves um, a couple of years ago. And, and all of that has been sort of debunked at this point. Um, so it's, I think, great um great landscape now to introduce CCB for coronaries. Brachytherapy, um, we uh, have this at, at my institution. I know not at every institution. Um, there is a lot required for um, the use of brachytherapy. You, know, you must have um, the, the presence of radiation physicist or, or, um, or other 
uh, radiation experts um, during the actual case. So it does require a little bit of um, sort of scheduling, so to speak, to be able to use this modality, which it make, can make it uh, a little tougher than some of your other modalities. Um, but I think brachytherapy, where I see it most frequently used um, in my institution, is really those patients that already have three layers, multivessel layers, may not be um, good surgical candidates, or you're really having a difficult time um, keeping them out of the lab because of recurrent um, ISR. I think brachytherapy is a good option. And in truth, we know that one in six patients with two or more stent layers um, will require a vascularization. I think it's important to, to emphasize that by the time that you have three layers, um, your, your lumen loss just from the additional second and third layer is significant. And, and those patients will undoubtedly be back multiple times um, for repeat PCI procedures. And I think there's, there's good data and it's been published in smaller um, observational studies to show um, the benefits of, in terms of reduction of MACE, um, even out to a year with the use of brachytherapy in patients with two or more stent layers. So I think a great option, if you don't have it at your institution, many, um, many institutions regionally that have it. And then additionally, um, this was more recent data um, published in JSKY in 2023 on brachytherapy in, in 330 patients um, uh, treated with brachytherapy. And when they looked out um, to um, year three, and it, it may seem, um, you know, when you say 50% target lesion failure at, at year three, I would say for these patients, that's, that's a win. That's 50% with two or three layers of stent um, that stayed out of the lab during that period of time. So I think um, not perfect, not going to, to help every single patient, but is very, very beneficial for those, again, that have um, uh, way, way, way many, too many layers already at that point. You know, and then lithotripsy, and I think you've already brought up a couple of, um, of, of potential issues with, with lithotripsy, and, and the data in terms of observational data of use in lithotripsy, I think will continue to, to start to come out. We're just getting some, um, some data from, from NCDR in terms of complications, how lithotripsy is being used, and how it's replacing um, atherectomy um, in, in um, other treatments in various cohorts, and I'll think we'll start to see this within ISR. Um, but cer certainly, I think you have to think about um, lithotripsy um, for your complex ISR, particularly when the stent is a little bit older. Um, early on, there are certainly um, uh, concerns for um, you know, stent fracture or, or um, even the, um, the drug-eluting component of the stent um, if there could be potentially issues um, with, with lithotripsy early on. So something to, to use and think about, but preferably in, in older stents. So this was actually a 65-year-old um, uh, patient that I had a history of um, right coronary artery PCI five years prior. Patient had, was, on, was continuing to smoke, unfortunately, and type 2 diabetes and had presented with chest pain and an abnormal stress test and the inferior distribution. You can see a couple of things, I think, about this um, right coronary artery. So very diffuse ISR um, throughout. There's an obvious osseal lesion. And then the outflow is not um, great. You can see that um, uh, the outflow is, is not um, very robust, um, but may plump up as you treat um, the ISR. Uh, so had many, many difficulties, tried um, um, NC balloons, they would watermelon, I couldn't get adequate expansion, patient already had um, two layers of stent, um, that were, some were malopposed, as you can see in this mid-RCA re region, um, that is where a lot of the issue was. So ended up um, in this particular case um, with laser, and I, I just show this case to, to show um, you know, different times when different modalities that we may not be pulling out every single day can be really useful. So I think in a lot of cases where there's so many stent layers um, um, and you're having a hard time um, just with sort of your more um, typical modalities, um, even passing, getting them to expand, um, avoiding watermelon, I think um, uh, laser can be a good sort of debulking strategy to then allow you um, to further treat the vessel.
Doctor so uh, Remmer, one question came as that has perfect timing because this yeah. is a very nasty um, ISR um, deployed over calcium or something. When one of the question came, I think that's building up on the DCB or DEB. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you recommend prepping vessel with laser and before you do DEP or uh, because according to this, uh, uh, the author or the person who's asking a question, this is a must. Like we have to do laser atherectomy, prepping the lesion before we do DEP or DCP. Yeah, so I, I think that I would say um, I think it's a must in, in certain lesions. So in, in this lesion, I was not going to get any sort of debulking without without laser. Um, uh, these were old stents. I can guarantee you if I had tried to put lithotripsy down, um, I, I would have had a hard time even passing it. Um, and so I think in these more complex lesions, particularly ones with, with two to three layers, um, lasers are great place to start to debulk before you you try to use drug-coated balloons because you you want, I think it's really important by the time you use a drug-coated balloon, you're actually going to get good expansion of the balloon. You're going to get good delivery of the drug um, to the stented area. And so I think laser gives you a lot of that uh, debulking. Um, and it's it's very, very easy to pass. Um, you can see here, it was, you can probably tell from even just pushing the laser in how my guide's backing out. So I was, able to debulk, you know, I was able to debulk um, and then be began to get good expansion. Um, and again, this was this was a year ago. I don't have access, didn't have access to a DCB. So um, able to get good NC expansion, um, begin to IVUS and really understand what's what's going on um, in the lesion, how much I need to push the lesions, um, so to speak. I think that's a great question, though. Yeah. Um, and then here, and this was before I ended up treating the osteo lesion as well, um, had to hang a stent out because you can see, but, but just take, take a look at just with the laser, look how much the outflow has really bulked up. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, I think just a great laser is great and I encourage everyone to, to use it. I think it's really underutilized um, in, in general practice. I think I see another question. Um, never mind that one. The, the other question is, uh, it's kind of in the RCA territory. The patient came with how the percent occlusion of the RCA. Uh, I'm not sure of the question um, saying that this ISR is just it's um, a lesion itself, but I'm assuming it's ISR because this is a topic mm -hmm. related. Is an angiogram the contrast is not clear because the outflow is completely compromised. The patient mm -hmm. had a V-fiber rest on the table, mm -hmm. and the question is how we can prevent this from happening. Yeah, I, I think that in that particular case, I think that's a great, that's a great question. But I think in that particular case, um, you know, I wonder if, if it's, if the lesion is so severe that there's contrast hang up, maybe something else is going on, um, dissection, um, some other thrombotic um, in nature to the lesion. And, and I bet that that contrast hang up in itself with poor outflow is probably what led to cardiac arrest. So I think um, just figuring out quickly why you think the contrast is, is hanging up, what's the etiology of that um, is probably the, the way to, to most prevent that. 100%, yeah. So I, I like this graphic. Um, this is from um, the consensus document. I think it's a simple graphic, but one to, to, to think about. So, um, you know, Talk about the mechanism, understand the mechanism as early as you can within the, the PCI procedure. We're talking about neoathero, is this neointimal hyperplasia, stent fracture, stent under expansion. Um, you know, and then begin to, to predilate, use cutting or scoring balloons. I use a lot of laser, so um, I think laser to help me debulk so then I can predilate because many of like I had a a, a case today where I had to, in order just to even pass any of the balloons. Um, and then, you know, thinking about if those strategies are unsuccessful, then very high pressure balloons, lithotripsy, rotational atherectomy, so on and so on. And then for those very severe patients where you can really plan in advance, um, I think uh, brachytherapy is still a, a good strategy um, to consider. There's many cases, and, and I know there's there's controversy over over this. Um, you know, some people would say, well, when you um, when you perform laser, and when you um, you know when you perform DCB or um, 
HOBA or NC balloons, you've disrupted, um, you know, the, you know, the, um, uh, the prior stent um, um, sort of struts, or if there was um, neoatherosclerosis, um, you've disrupted that area and you really need to add another stent layer. You know, that really for me is not a hard and fast rule. Um, so if there's one layer and I've performed a lot of work um, and I want to make sure that, you know, I think um, I get adequate um, expansion whenever possible, I, I do consider a second layer stent if I'm already at two or three layers, I do everything I possibly can to avoid um, adding an additional layer. Um, I, I think really you're causing potentially more harm than good um, in, in that scenario. So I would just say that there's always, um, there's always gray um, in PCI procedures. And I think really have to consider the patient, their risk factors before making those judgment calls. And then I think this is just another, I think, I think it's, it's, um, good, especially when, when we're starting off with trainees or we're starting off early on in practice to have um, ways that we think about um, treating these patients. Um, certainly, if, if there's a dissection or, or at the stent edge, I always consider a, a repeat um, drug eluding stent. If there's stent fracture, there's obvious stent fracture, I think probably pretty important to place another stent there um, because that will be just a nidus for either thrombus or other things non-overlapping stents and you've got the small little area um, that's, um, we've all seen those when, when they haven't quite overlapped the stent and there's a small little area of, of uh, vessel that's uncovered, that's really a nidus for um, either restenosis um, or thrombosis in the future. And so thinking about DES in those situations, but again, um, it really depends on the patient. It really depends on the number of layers, um, so on and so on. So this is actually case number three, but one that um, I love to show. It's a 62-year-old uh, with a history of hypertension, familial hyperlipidemia, who presented for exertional chest pain. They had undergone echo stress tests with LV dilatation at peak exercise, and they presented for an elective um, heart catheterization. And so this is where I'm going to start to move into just briefly talking about um, thrombosis, because I think while restenosis is, imp is important, um, Another reason for, for stent failure is thrombosis, and it's important to talk about as well. So you look at this lesion, um, you know, and, and certainly that could be a cause for anterior um, distribution, abnormalities and in, 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 in on a stress test. Um, you know, it's out of bifurcation, but it's certainly very doable. So this, remember, an elective procedure coming in, they're coming, they're, they're on the cath table, they've gotten loaded with aspirin, they are heparinized adequately, ACT is kept high throughout the case, 600 milligrams of Plavix is given, and, and this is a practice around the country, you give Plavix many times um, on the table, patients already gotten opiates um, um, and other drugs um, that may potentially um, impair their ability to absorb a P2Y12 inhibitor. So then the case goes very well. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I enjoy doing bifurcation procedures, but I also understand that there's potential issues if you have a um, size mismatch between the branch vessel and the, um, the uh, main vessel in terms of, of performing um, uh, bifurcation two strength strategy. So in this case, I was able to get away with provisional. I think had a pretty um, decent result, had you know some stenosis of the osteum of the branch vessel, but um, had ivus both vessels and felt pretty confident with that. So then the patient goes back, chest pain free, um, goes back to our outpatient um, unit. Um, and then about 20 minutes later, I get a page Patients got inferior elevations on an EKG, crushing chest pain. And when I arrive to the room, I can see um, in the vomit basin or in the, the basin that she was holding that um, there were bits and pieces of her plavix there. Um, so it had become, um, during the case, I don't think had ever really fully digested the plavix. Um, I think many times, and Mike Gibson shows these images on Twitter quite a bit of the plavix pill sitting in the stomach. Um, I think a lot of times it's even sitting in the esophagus. Um, 
during our, our elective procedures. And, and I think can really put these patients at risk. And you can see obvious thrombus um, in the proximal and midsection of, of the stent. Um, we're able to, and the reason for inferior elevations is this big wrap around LEV. Um, and so we're getting inferior elevations because it was um, just a huge territory of the LAD that it was um, supplying. We're able to, to perform penumbra. Um, uh, she had normal renal function. So we're able to give her um, just a little bit of a, a G2B3A, just a couple boluses and actually get, um, get the um, resolution of both her symptoms, pain and angiographic appearance. Um, had IVIST, um, everything was opposed correctly. Um, but I think that this is, this is a more common scenario than we think. You know, so is this stent failure or pharmacologic therapy? I would say this, in this situation, it's pharmacologic therapy. Um, lack of absorption of pharmacotherapy. Our patients are, I know it, at my institution, everyone's getting typically fentanyl. Everyone's um, getting Versed usually. Um, and, and a lot of patients are not fully digesting. And if you think about P2Y12 pharmacokinetics, particularly Plavix, which is what we use for stable angina elective procedures, um, you, if you give a 600 milligram Plavix dose to the patient, you're really not seeing steady state for 60 to 90 minutes. And that's the time period when their ACT drops to, to normal once they head to the back where you can see problems. Um, and other considerations, and I bring this up a lot with the fellows in shock patients, um, really high risk for them because they don't have ad adequate gut, um, uh, um, gut blood flow. So you can have gut ischemia, um, poor absorption of the drugs you're getting. They're getting concomitant opiates. They might be intubated. Um, so they're on lots of medications, um, sort of treating them for sedation reasons. Uh, so I think it's really important when you're thinking both about your stable PCIs plus your, your MCS, your shock patients, to consider how well they're absorbing uh, medications when you're thinking about stent thrombosis. And so I'll go through uh, management of stent um, thrombosis here briefly, really different depending on what time period. So acute stent thrombosis really a lot of, most of the time, malapposition, um, edge disease, underexpansion. I'd also add um, pharmacologic issues, um, late um, a stent thrombosis, obviously um, more likely to be neoathero or restenosis, um, evagination, things like that. So important to, to know the time period of the stent to be able to understand the stent thrombosis classification. And then I'll put in that our um, Sky really worked hard, I think, to put together this consensus document that also focused on stent thrombosis and also focused on uh, great images to demonstrate um, why you have stent thrombosis on both OCT um, and IVUS. But again, if you're not using it frequently enough, it may be hard to diagnose what's actually going on with the patient um, if you're not understanding um, the images. And the biggest predictors of stent thrombosis, so a clopidogrel stop less than 30 days under sizing of the stent, really it, my takeaways here, are early premature um, uh, discontinuation or cessation of your P2Y12 inhibitors, undersizing, or, or other things like um, malignancy or TEMI flow post PCI less than three. I think that's that goes without saying. Um, but you know we're also focused, I think, on making sure the stents the right size, making sure we've post dilated it correctly, um, making sure we don't have edge dissections or stent fractures. That we can't forget the pharmacologic. Um, stuff. It's equally um, as important um, to making sure our patients um, are successful. So for stent thrombosis, um, need to know mechanism of failure, whether it's malapposition, deformity, um, edge dissection, stent um, under expansion. Um, you know, and, and for I've had for patients that have really extensive stent thrombosis, I've had a case or two where again, laser is very, very helpful um, to break up a lot of that thrombus. Um, um, but also thinking about uh, thrombectomy, your pharmacotherapy, um, these are where, and I'm a big Kangrelor user um, for patients that don't have adequate P2Y12 inhibitor um, blockade. 
But I think once the thrombus is there and it's there in a significant amount, um, if the patient doesn't have severe renal dysfunction, I oftentimes go for a GTB3A inhibitor because I think really those are most potent. And then um, obviously balloon angioplasty and cutting balloons. Um, but again, a lot of the same strategies as restenosis. Um, but I think that thrombectomy obviously and laser for me are, are um, very useful. So I'll, you know, I'm going to end up... Just before you conclude the slides, yeah. I went before, if you look at it, I mean, all dependent on the imaging. So if uh, yes. Yes. sometimes yeah. you see thrombosis or restenosis, um, you have to know the mechanism. Again, if you look at the, the therapy, the top two are overlapping with each other. But if you have the first three deformity at the beginning or etiology or mechanism of disease, then you have to use different modality. This is, I think, where imaging become more helpful, not just balloon angioplasty or drop a next scent, uh, maybe not going to be helpful. Maybe it's going to hurt the patient. So definitely emphasizing the need for imaging to differentiate these subtle things. Yeah, like exactly. So in my case, you know, one of the things I immediately thought was, well, is the stent, is something wrong with the stent? Is the stent yes. fractured? Is the stent now opposed? You know, what what's wrong with the stent? And imaging helped me to answer that question. And so mm. then imaging was able to successfully lead me to say, oh, this is pharmacologic therapy. Um, the patient threw up. I mean, obviously I saw the, but the patient threw up the pharmacologic therapy um, and right. that is, that's what's going on. But you can't answer that question without imaging. Um, 100%. Totally agree. So um, again, um, I hate to sort of chime and, and, and harp on the same things over and over again, um, but to understand the mechanism failure, you have to do intravascular imaging. And, and I think one of, the, um, one of the key things that I think we as a, um, a group of operators and um, interventionalists within the U.S. have to understand is, well, within my local practice environment, A, how do I get competent to read IVIS or OCT images and react to them? And B, how, how do I bring up the rest of the lab to use OCT or IVIS, whatever is available um, on a routine basis? So I really understand what those images um, are meaning. And I, I know that Sky is working on a couple of, of, um, of initiatives right now. And one of those initiatives is to start focusing on um, educating staff, so the technicians and cath lab nurses to, be, to develop champions and super users of, of, of IVIS and OCT to help set up, help troubleshoot, um, really take away maybe the, the activation energy that exists for certain operators to then feel more comfortable using it. And so I think there's, there's going to be a lot of push by industry to try to help figure out in, in low using centers, um, can you come up with a, a super user um, of, of these technologies? I think um, one of the exciting um, areas that I'm, I'm interested to see research in terms of uptake for ISR in the coming years will be DCB um, to the US market and, and see more importantly, what does DCB do to our rates of re-stenting? Um, does, it, does it decrease it? I hypothesize it will. Um, and what does it do to our overall rates of, of ISR? And so I think um, really exciting to, to look at that question in the next couple of years, two to three years, and see how that changes. Um, but all of this, you know the mechanism failure, um, you, you're using intravascular imaging, we've got DCB coming down um, the road. We have to keep in mind the basics and really teaching our, our fellows and, and considering um, Pharma, pharmacokinetics. Uh, I think it's really important to consider your pharmacology and make sure that that is adequate, um, both during those elective procedures, but also particularly with these shock patients, because I think that's when we're um, the patients potentially don't have adequate um, P2I12 receptor um, inhibition um, because of the variety of things that I've mentioned here. So I'll go ahead and conclude there. And if there's any other questions or no, um, it was just perfect on time, Dr. Reimer, but I think this is really a very important and highlight a couple of most uh, two things that we have been speaking about all the time, the utilization of imaging. Our hope is with the education that we gave us tonight, we're going to see more acquisition of imaging, which is eventually going to decrease the rate of uh, 
ISR or stent thrombosis. But at the same time, also, if we have that incident happening, we have now options like a DCB uh, the, that or DEB that can help us treating these patients without the need for extra or more stenting in these patients. The last concept I'd like to entertain is uh, sometimes sending a patient to cabbage like what you did in the first case or second case, it's not a bad thing. It's not a, like, uh, I feel like our ego or our, I don't know what you call it, and no, I have to fix it. I think in stopping, especially if it is not acute, you have three flow, taking off the patient off the table, speaking to a surgeon, I don't think this is a, a bad option, maybe the, the most durable option for these patients. <laughs> I would really encourage, you know, if um, you're going to meet those people where in this particular patient's life, um, she was going to continue to come back every three to six months, no matter what we did. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start to see how their quality of life diminishes, they can't work. Um, we've had to transplant some patients that were, couldn't be cabbaged. They couldn't undergo bypass for a variety of reasons, but ended up transplanting them because they have had so many layers. I think we've performed three transplants at Duke for, for ISR. It's, it's significant issue. If you can stop at the point and they're not actively infarcting, particularly if their LAD has severe ISR, and you can give them after they've had you know, three layers of stent of good cabbage, then you have done them um, such a service, I think. Absolutely. I mean, that's really, again, speaking to uh, being inclusive and hard time approach for these cases. But again, um, as at the highlight of this talk, I mean, imaging, imaging before and after PCI to tell you how, what to, to tackle the lesion, understand the lesion. And also, if you did a good job after fixing the lesion, it didn't leave anything behind that need to be fixed. Uh, Dr. Reimer, really, I mean, we promise every time we have to finish on time and you did a wonderful job uh, starting on time and finishing on time, giving a great overview of a very important topic in interventional cardiology field uh, for ISR and stent thrombosis. Um, Dr. Reimer, appreciate your time and for all the audience, thank you for joining us. Really, uh, we enjoyed everybody here and thanks for all the question and the engagement. This record, this uh, uh, webinar will be recorded. It will be hosted on the facet.com website. Once it's recorded, we'll be sending an email for all the people who registered so we can go back to it. And for CME activities, please make sure you click the survey after and make sure you collect your one hour CME after the activity. Dr. Reimer, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.